I'm in the part of the National Archives that does uh, policy for federal agencies. And so when you talk about the National Archives, we're the largest archives in the world. Uh, presidential libraries are part of the National Archives. We have record centers around the country. So we're involved across the life cycle of all government records. I work for the part agency services and we do policy for federal agencies. And so there's different legislation governing how content comes to us. There's the Presidential Records Act, there's the Federal Records Act. We have agreements with Congress. I have a colleague from the Library of Congress here and we get some of their records. Um, we have separate agreements with uh, the Supreme Court, but the guidance I write is those 330 or 40 or however many federal agencies there are. So I don't deal with the White House, I deal with general federal agencies. And just due to the complexity of that, the answer is always, it depends. And so it's very, very difficult for us to say, you will give us PDF A1B. Uh, because, you know, some people will look and they'll say, okay, we're going to do our stuff that way. And some people are going to just walk away. So it's hopefully in my, my <laughs> thing. So shall I go ahead and dive in? Okay, so I gave a bit of who I am. I'm Kevin Divorcey. Uh, I'm the supervisory electronic records format specialist at the National Archives. Um, I'm actually physically located in New York. Um, so that was a little bit of background about the archives. Leonard, when he spoke, he mentioned billions of uh, PDFs kicking around. And if you like to think of it, the, the Library of Congress is here in the room in the National Archives. We're kind of the final resting place for billions and billions and billions of PDFs that are created um, by the U.S. government. So we deal with those files that uh, relate to permanent records. And so we have a keen interest in content being created and making sure that it's you know, good. Um, I, I should say, you know, I'm here and uh, there's a standard disclaimer. It's like a, I'm speaking as Kevin DeForcy. I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of the Library of Congress, but I will describe all the work that I've done in developing a new transfer guidance to guide agencies in giving us content. So. Um, transfer guidance revision. Uh, NARA has a long history with electronic records um, going back to the late 60s, early 70s, but for many, for decades, uh, electronic records equated mainframe data coming from NASA, Social Security, uh, Department of Defense. And so our transfer guidance up until 2002, 2004 was very simple. You could go to the Code of Federal Regulations where the rules for government are one inch magnetic tape, EBCDIC, or ASCII character set. That was our format guidance. Um, as a part of a previous uh, presidential e government initiative, they did a revision back between 2002 and 2004, and they expanded NARA's transfer guidance to you know, recognize the change in the way electronic records were being used. And so they, they came up with um, it was a collaboration. It wasn't just the National Archives sitting down and saying, what formats do we want people to use? But there was uh, guidance on email, web records, special guidance on PDF. Um, there was guidance on geospatial, scan text, and that was pretty much it. So between 2004 and 2014, that was what was in place for the U.S. government. Um, I was hired in 2010 and given this task of revise the format guidance and you know it was interesting because when I was introduced uh, people described it as the transfer guidance and format guidance interchangeably and it's, it's like what does that mean so a lot of my job was trying to learn what was this thing that's been in existence for the past 10 years what are the issues that people have had with it and then what can we do in a kind of rigid, rigid governmental structure to improve the situation. So, you know, for this talk, I'll, I'll explain the goals of what, what, when we were in our learning process, um, and one of the big goals was defining the scope of what we were doing, and then trying to figure out, you know, what does the government need and what does the National Archives need to improve the situation. And, you know, the situation that I'm describing was, we had this guidance that had been up for years, but it was proving to be a log jam. Um, there were a lot of cases where agencies would look at it and they would see they're not in compliance. I don't know how many federal employees are in this room. Are there any federal records officers? I know Stephen Levinson. 
you know, case in point, though, WordPerfect was mentioned earlier. Um, lawyers love WordPerfect. They still love WordPerfect because it did uh, legal citations very elegantly, and it still does. National Archives never accepted WordPerfect as a format. Agencies, you know, th this guidance has been up for 10 years. They looked at it. They didn't stop using WordPerfect. <laughs> you know, that, that was just the reality. We can say, here's what we want. Some people will listen, some people won't. Um, the biggest problem was it was this, it, you know, things go up into the Code of Federal Regulations and it, it's a lot of work to revise things. And so part of our challenge was how can we do something that's a little more flexible? Um, how can we balance the National Archives need? You know, it was mentioned preserving things for 50 years at the National Archives. We, our mandate is to preserve permanent records for the life of the Republic. So what that means, who knows? But uh, so we have a, a keen interest in uh, open standards and making sure that in the future we're going to be able to go back and interpret things. Um, we knew that since you know, EBCDIC, ASCII, and then we expanded it to, it was about 14 formats from 2004 onward. It just wasn't enough coverage to account for what was going on in the federal government. And also, one of the things, you know, WordPerfect is a good example. If people were using WordPerfect, there was this almost unspoken thing. You have WordPerfect. We don't take WordPerfect. We're not going to look, but you need to change that WordPerfect and give it to us. And the problem with that is, you know, that I'm not going to dive into authenticity, but there are questions. If they're just doing this transformation from one format to another just to make us happy, are they really going to do the kind of digital preservation that you would want to make sure that the paragraphs are right and the, the character count is right and the font's right? So that's always been a concern. So we, we tried to go about it in a way that hopefully we can minimize that. So um, here are links. I'm, I'm sure they'll make these available. But if you haven't looked at our, our new guidance, here they are. Um, so in terms of scope, this was one of the biggest challenges that we faced in trying to revise our transfer guidance. Um, you know, this is a life cycle that I came up with, you know, it's just standard electronic record life cycle. The problem that we encountered, and it relates to the disposition of government records, is U.S. courts. I know I've seen disposition schedules 99 years. I, I've seen, um, I think there's one, seriously, Life of the Republic plus 25 years. Um, there's intelligence agencies 100 years. Um, with electronic records, that makes it very, very difficult. And so with our transfer guidance, it wasn't just people looking and saying, okay, we're ready to transfer to the National Archives. Are our formats okay? People were standing up new systems and they're saying, oh, we want to make sure that the National Archives will take these records 20 years from now, look at their transfer guidance. Also, you know, if you're maintaining records for 100 years, looking back and keeping them in formats, and it's like, it, there's no way that a single set of guidance relating to electronic records can span 100 years. It, it doesn't work, I can guarantee you that. So we've tried to take a different approach, but we really are sh focusing on that point of transfer. So we're not putting up guidance that says how you should scan a document. We are putting up minimal guidance that says if you want to transfer permanent records, these are the high-level criteria that we, must, we really need to insist on. Um, so we also changed, part of the problem was, you know, we've been accepting EBCDIC. I don't know, how many people are familiar with EBCDIC? Few people, that's good. Um, I, I, yeah, that's the problem. Um, we, we've been accepting EBCDIC since the late 60s, early 70s. It's a character encoding. There's zone decimal, pack bit, straight. Yep, there's different flavors of it, and it was coming off of reels of tape, and so it wasn't different. Nobody was going through and saying, this is this kind of EBCDIC, this is this kind. So we have some very expensive applications that we use to validate EBCDIC. Um, presumably, one day, EBCDIC, people are going to quit using it. I know that uh, I read the last mainframe was retired by NASA a couple of years ago. But in our current rules, it, we can't just say, oh, yeah, we've been accepting EBCDIC since 1972. 
we don't accept it anymore. Uh, you don't want to be in a gotcha game with federal agencies. We need to be very predictable. So we altered things, and we, we have preferred acceptable and we added in acceptable for imminent transfer as a way to elegantly sunset so that we're not just saying, yeah, we've accepted that forever. We're not accepting it anymore. It's a way to, to notify agencies, if you've been using this format for the past 30 years, be aware that at some point in the future, we're going to discontinue our support for it. So that seemed um, like a good approach to that problem is that National Archives, just because we accepted something for a long time, are we obligated to accept it forever, or do we have that flexibility? <coughs> so this was an attempt. The other problem is, you know, what categories of e records do we bring in? Um, and this is, we have an organizational structure of custodial units that are responsible for caring for records. We go through transformations every five years, and so it didn't seem like we wanted to tie our record categories to that organizational structure because it does uh, change. So we worked to analyze um, you know, what, what are we getting, what are the big issues, and then come up with categories that seem to fit and hopefully match disposition schedules and match the reality of what's going on. The bigger trick was then, you know, how do you choose what formats should be accepted? And the previous talk, I think that, you know, I can't, I don't have time to really dive into sustainability and all of the different measures that we use, but I can guarantee you it wasn't an arbitrary decision. And, you know, I'm here, it's PDF day. My talk's not about PDF in particular, um, but I think some of the previous conversations about PDF and it being an ISO standard and all of the work, it's very relevant and, and you'll see And this, you know, when we were looking at formats of what should the National Archives accept, it wasn't, we weren't, I, I promise you, we were not sitting there thinking, how can we arrange things so we bring in more PDFs? That, it, it really was, it's like, how can we analyze formats and determine formats for each category that are appropriate? So on the left, I have the, the old transfer guidance and these were just separate bulletins that were released over about two years. And on the right, the new category. So you can see we expanded things. Excuse me. Um, so the big thing, you know, it always bothered me that there was a single transfer standard for PDF because as Leonard said, PDF is an envelope. You can put lots of different content. And so it, 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 it always kind of stuck out. The intent behind it was kind of scanned text, and it was like if you're giving us PDFs, but the way it was presented was confusing, and it did wind up confusing a lot of uh, federal agencies who thought, oh, they have PDF guidance. That means anything we can shoehorn into a PDF they'll take, and that, that was not the intent behind having that, so it, it proved a problem. So the way we've done it now is we've identified additional categories, hopefully accounting for the vast majority of permanent electronic records that are out there so that a records officer coming to our guidance will see a home for their content. Um, historically, I'll say it's interesting because a lot of things have come up over time and it always raises the question, it's like, well, what did you do before? And in a lot of cases, the answer is, well, up until this point, we gave you paper. And so we're, we're just now starting to see um, geospatial files and uh, architectural drawing files from the early and mid 90s. And it turns out this is the first time under this schedule that an electronic file has been given to the National Archives. Previously, they always gave us a piece of the paper. So it's late. You know, we're on the, the far side of the wave, um, but it's starting to come down on us now that all of these records from the late 80s, early 90s are hitting us. And it, it's curious because. Um, I have a colleague who describes the National Archives as an ad hocracy. You know, there is no normal. There's 300 agencies, and it's impossible to predict when, you know, we're, we have teams that uh, go out and they poke agencies that we haven't heard from in 30 years, trying to, you know, what's going on? What do you have? You must have something. Give us your stuff. Um, so we did do, and it, it, we worked um, looking at the Library of Congress has a wonderful sustainability page where they've broken down criteria to analyze file formats. Um, the Archives of the Netherlands has one, National Library of New Zealand has one. We kind of came up with our own and it was, 
you know, let's sit down and look at these formats and figure out, you know, what can I get a copy of the word perfect specification? And yes, but it's for 5.1 for DOS. I couldn't find anything newer than that. Um, and so we kind of graded, came up with a grading for formats uh, and then, you know, plugging them in. Um, the major changes I, I mentioned before, we don't really want agencies to do transformations. And so we developed this guidance as a way of giving options. And it's options for both the National Archive staff, but then also for agencies. So if you're doing architectural drawings and you're using proprietary system B, we acknowledge that and we hope that they acknowledge that we can't preserve every proprietary piece of software for the life of the Republic, but hopefully we've identified ranges of formats where somewhere in there there's going to be something that you can agree with our appraisal archivists that, yeah, for that system and that type of information, this is good enough. Um, we had a 20 questions, technical questionnaires that everybody hated and we were able to get rid of those. So that, they would add, you know, is it scanned at 300 PPI? Is it, 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 and we tried to back away from that kind of what you should have done 10 years ago when you created this guidance and focus more on, um, okay, you're transferring it. Is this minimally good enough to be counted as a permanent record? So, you know, it's PDF A day. I, I didn't come here to talk about PDF in particular, but I did throw in a side of, you know, and it's interesting. Being an ISO standard makes a big difference. Um, if you look at our transfer guidance and go through it, the majority, of, the vast majority of the formats are ISO standard-based formats. There are a couple, like TIFF, where, okay, it's not an ISO standard, but it's a ubiquitous standard, it's an open standard, and so it made it in there as well. There are a couple, the email formats are a little funny, and but, and, and you know, this was not my intent. It, it, this is the way that the, the things fell out, that as options for these different categories, PDF does appear. And, you know, th there is that question, it would be wonderful, and we've had this conversation, it would be great if everybody in the federal government did all of their word processing and created beautiful PDF A1 files. Um, but that's not the reality. So we have provided options. The thing that we have not done is saying, if you are doing this, if you are scanning these really important documents, you must use this format. We're just not to that level of complexity yet. So we've put this up there and that's kind of a next step is do additional life cycle guidance where we can tell people if this is what you're doing, if you're, you're digitizing these audio tapes that are about to die, you, you really need to go to this level. Um, but that's, you know, it's a separate project. But you can see, you know, ge geospatial, uh, architectural drawings, presentations, digital posters, word process text, scan text, the except, you know, and this is something um, we're seeing it in our interactions with federal agencies that they are using PDF for their own purposes um, in conversations with our custodial units and the people that provide access to records. PDF is a known quantity. It's you know, good, we don't have to be specialists in every proprietary format, but we can develop a level of expertise in a single envelope and understand it much better, which is to our benefit. Um, so, but there are challenges. You know, I, our colleagues at the Library of Congress, we, I got a phone call. Uh, NASA has offered us two and a half petabytes of video files. And if you want to see some jaws drop at the National Archives, offer them two and a half petabytes of anything. Happily, the format was in my transfer guidance, so I was, it's good as far as I'm concerned, but it's two and a half petabytes is a lot of data. So, you know, it simply is more data coming to us than our archivists can get, you know, we can't double click on every file. That's not realistic. And so we really do rely on um, automated tools to identify and validate and make sure that things are what they say they are. And so it's that fear, it is an envelope, and do we know what's inside the envelope is a challenge for us, and we have these conversations a lot. Um, you know, PDF A3, I can imagine some wonderful uses across the government for PDF A3. I can also imagine some horrible problems for us in the future if we, if, if things were done in a non-standard way or we weren't aware of what the use was. 
So, uh, you know, these idea of, you know, variation between the creation of a file or validation. Um, new initiatives, there's a lot going on here. The, uh, I know Duff is involved in this, but it's the conformance checking, which would be great for any large archive to be able to automate the validation and identification of files and know that they're being created correctly up front. That would be great. And then ISO 32000-2, PDF 2.0, a lot of new capabilities coming along that I'm sure agencies are going to be interested in, and so the National Archives is going to be interested in as well. So, so that's my talk. It's a, you know, off on a tangent into federal record-keeping standards and transfer to the National Archives.